Well, hello, Vintage Church. How you guys doing today? Y'all doing all right? Come on. It's good to see you. I have actually not been here the last several weeks. Uh, my name's Stephen, and I actually lead pastor here at this location, but I've been spending the last couple weeks over at our Belton location, and I've been absolutely blown away about what God's doing there. Many of you may not know this, but we actually planted uh, this location just a little over eight years ago. Then a little over a year ago, we planted our Belton location, moved it into a permanent uh, facility about six months later, and then about 12 weeks ago, we planted our third location in Liberty Hill. Let me just tell you, none of that would have been possible without the OG. Do you know what the OG stands for? The original gangster here at Harker High. So come on, give it up for everybody who did that. I'm not really supposed to say this, but you guys are my favorite, and I'm very, very excited uh, to be back. You know, before we jump into our message, we've been in this series called Mixed Emotions. We've been learning how to deal with with what we feel. Before we jump in, and I have a great practical message uh, for you today that you're literally going to be able to use the moment you step out of that door. Before I do that, though, I want to invite you to an event that we're actually having tonight called Vision Night. It is a membership dessert. It's an event tonight at 6.30 at this location. You know, over the last year, myself, um, our leadership, our staff, our board of elders, we've really been praying about what the future is for our church, especially since recently we've moved from a church in one location really to a family of churches, and God has really been talking to us. And what we really want to do is we want to give you a sneak peek of what the next few years at Vintage Church is going to look like. And let me just tell you, we're going to raise this roof a little bit. I'm just, it's going to be incredible. We're going to be able to, now here at Vintage, we call all of our serve team uh, members, uh, members. That's our, those, that is our membership. Maybe you don't serve on a serve team, but you do call Vintage Church home. Here's what I need you to do if you want to come. Uh, I need you to go on our Vintage Church app and register to attend this event, let us know. You can also go to the website at vintage.church forward slash events and you can sign up there. We're going to have a great dessert spread. I heard crumble cookies are going to be there. I mean, I just heard, I heard it. Okay. Maybe you need a date night. That's super cheap. Okay. We're going to take care of your kids too. Come and hang out with us. It's going to be a great night of of uh, really of worship, of vision. Many of you maybe haven't heard our whole story. We're going to talk a little bit about vintage from the beginning and what we see in the next several years. So I want to encourage you to do that. So we're going to jump in to this series where we're learning how to deal with how we feel. How many of you men are just really, you really love that? You just really love getting in touch with your feelings. Anybody who just love that? Yeah, you're just kind of like, you just, you're, listen, that's why your wives, your mothers, and your sisters drug you to church. Come on. It's going to be a really, really good time. Really what we're learning is um, God's mind, his will, and his ways, and how we deal with our emotions. You know, before you give your life to Christ, the Bible says that you're governed uh, by your feelings, that really however you feel is the way you go. And you can look around the world to those who don't know Christ. Uh, you can see that they just kind of wake up and kind of follow their feelings and where that leads them. The Bible says, though, that we, when you and I as believers, we give our lives to Christ. It says that we're born again. We're born into a new family. But the Bible also teaches how the part of us that connects with God, our spirit, is born again. And part of the Christian life is learning how to allow your spirit, which is the part of you that connects with God, to really run your entire life. The biblical worldview on emotions are our actions as believers drive how we feel. And that's really what we're learning. We're really relearning in some sense what God's original purpose uh, is in this area. And I want to encourage you, if you've missed any of these messages, we've really laid a foundation to understanding this topic uh, from the Bible. The Bible has a lot to say about it. As a matter of fact, today I'm going to talk about a subject that I believe affects every single one of us, and that is what do you do when you feel conflicted? Now, I don't just mean like whether to go this way or that way, but I mean like, you know, when you're waiting in a restaurant and, you know, it's taking forever and you got seated way before the other person, but they get their food first and the waiter or the waitress has kind of got an attitude, you know what I'm saying? And they're, they're really not really trying, you know, don't seem to really care about their job. And then, they, then they're kind of rude to you. And, and, you know, you're kind of wondering, you're conflicted. Like, do I act like a Christian or do I just, you know, create, you know, commit a crime? Anybody? 
That's what I mean when I say conflicted. Today, we're going to talk about conflict. The truth is, as believers, the Bible has a lot to say about how you and I navigate conflict. I would say, as a pastor, the number one thing that I do in the family of God is actually help you all get along. Because I do believe if you and I can embrace God's plan for how to deal with conflict when, not if it comes, we can lead better lives and lives, and most importantly, we can shine a brighter light in our world. You know, as you look out at our world, conflict is absolutely everywhere in our world, but it's also in our own life. It's in our workplaces. It's with our spouses. Anybody ever had any conflict with your spouse? Yeah, me either. It's with your kids. It's, it's in your community, right? Because you and I live in a broken world, there's conflict everywhere in every area and segment of society. And again, one of the most important things that you can learn how to do, and trust me, you have to learn or relearn how to do this, is how to deal with uh, conflict in a biblical manner. The truth is you can't be in unity and in conflict at the same time. Time And, you know, I want to open up, and I, I want to say this. I don't, has anybody in here ever heard of the Apostle Paul? Anybody ever heard of him? He's a pretty popular guy, you know, got, got radically saved. I mean, he was, like, killing Christians, and then he's, like, building churches. It was crazy. Okay, but you may not know this. He actually wrote two-thirds of all the letters that we have in the New Testament to uh, Christians. He was writing to the church. He dedicated his entire life to planting, building, and establishing uh, these churches in the ancient world. As a matter of fact, none of us would be here if Paul didn't go first. So I think he has a little something to say, uh, and, and, and I think we should pay attention. For example, I, I actually verified this this week. Did you know at the very beginning of every one of those letters, every single one without exception, without exception, he opens up the letter like this. Dearly beloved, you know, we uh, are gathered here today, and you know, in the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ our Lord, remembering that, our, that, that, that we're eternal and we're to love, to govern each, each other, in that grace and mercy, can you all just get along? <laughs> Stop arguing about stuff that doesn't matter. No one cares about what you think about this and about that. Let's get over ourselves so we can get on to kingdom business. I'm paraphrasing. That's a paraphrase from the book of Second Hesitations, chapter 2, verse 15. But as a pastor, you might, have, you might have realized just then, I can kind of relate to Paul, the church builder. You and I, I believe this with all my heart. The Bible says, Jesus himself said, we are supposed to be the light of the world. We cannot be the light in the world if we're constantly fighting with each other. If we're constantly in battle against our own body. The Bible says that upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not be able to come against it from the outside. But if the devil can't hit us from the outside, he will disrupt us from the inside. And that's really what we're going to learn about today. The church is really a place in space, a greenhouse, for we learn to get along here in spiritual family, just like a natural family, so we can get along there. And so I want to read this in Romans chapter 12, again written by the Apostle Paul to the church at Rome. He says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Do not repay resentment for more resentment. Do not repay cruelty for more cruelty. Do not repay racism with more racism. I'm just, again, that's what he's saying. Insert whatever is evil into that, and that he's talking about. Meaning that the strategies of this world will not work for the believer. He says, be careful. Why should you be careful? Because it's very easy not to be. It is very easy to fly off the handle. It is very easy to act in a way that doesn't represent who you really are in Christ. He says, be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, everyone say me. me. He didn't say as far as it depends on culture or as far as it depends on that government institution or that nonprofit organization. He says, me, as far as it depends on you individually, he says, live at peace with everyone. What he's saying here by, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit is that we may not want conflict, we may not want arguments, but they will happen. And we've got to pay very careful attention to how we individually navigate that. Now, this is important because a lot of people are calling for wild revolution and change. They're, they're, they're calling to tear down everything that our society and our world is built on. And they're completely leaving out the real thing that changes everything. And that's at the individual level. 
Isn't it interesting on social media? You can, you can literally virtue signal and seem virtuous, but not be at all. You can say, I'm pro this or an anti that, or I'm a part of this party or that party or that group or this group and appear to be virtuous all the while reflecting all personal responsibility in your own life. And this is very important because when we teach about the Bible, and this is important for those of you that may be in the military, you're going to travel, you're going to have to find a good church early on. You need to make sure you find a church that teaches you how to stand on the Bible, that teaches you the truth of Scripture because it is the only truth that works long term in your life. And by the way, when you read the Bible, it doesn't talk about them. James says it's like a mirror reflecting who God is in light of who you, everyone say me, in light of who you are. And it's foolish for us to pretend that the problem's out there when the problem's actually right here. Why do I say that? Why do I go off on that? Yes, it was kind of a tangent, but it has a lot to do with dealing with conflict. Most of the problems that we, we have and the things that even I've seen as a pastor are people neglecting their own responsibility in dealing with conflict. And there's some results that come as a consequence. There are three devastating effects of unresolved conflict. The first is it hinders your relationship with God. 1 John chapter 4, verse 20 says, Whoever claims to love God yet hates his brother or sister is a liar. Think about this for a minute. This is John, okay? He was Jesus' favorite. You know, all the pictures resting in his bosom. This is a precious brother, John. He literally says, the person who claims to love God but hates his brother or sister is a liar. Now, think about this for a minute, okay? Who's your brother or sister? By the way, not everyone is your brother or sister. If everyone's your brother or sister, no one is because you have no responsibility, Meaning, if if everyone's your family, no one's your family. He's actually talking to the family of God. He's literally talking to a church just like that. Look to your left. Look to your left. Your other left. Look to your right. All right. That's your family. And you know what? They got problems, and you may not like them. And I'm I'm very grateful that God didn't put that armpit near the nose. I'm so grateful for that. But the truth of the matter is, you may be able to mess with your family, but nobody else does. And what he's saying here is to pretend that you're a Christian and to continually slug mud and to continually beat down your brothers and sisters in Christ, okay, you're just kidding yourself. You really don't love Jesus, and you certainly don't love the family of God. For whoever does not love their brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. Here's what he also goes on to say. It's practice. It's practice, right? You love here in the context of church where, guess what? The rules in here are all different. You don't get to just quit a brother or sister. They're there. You know what the good thing is about a church, too? You can go to a small group, and it's like horrible. But don't worry. There's always another small group. Come on. You can find your people in a big church, but the reality is, the reality is you're always going to have an opportunity to be offended. Well, here, the rules don't apply like they do in the world. They're different in here. Why? Because you're priceless image bearers of God. We, we do things differently in the family of God. See, church isn't just about hearing preaching on a Sunday. It's about walking with the broken people and learning How, in spite of our collective weaknesses and individual ones, he that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. It's rising above those things. Church is so much more important than you could ever realize, especially in that way. Proverbs 6.16 says this, There are six things the Lord hates. Oh, I forgot one, and the one I forgot is worse than all the other ones. There are seven things that he detests. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that kill the innocent, a a heart that plots evil, feet that race to do wrong, a false witness who pours out lies, and number seven, a person who messes relationally in a family, who causes discord or division. You know, Christians love to blame the devil, you know, for stuff. We do that a lot of time. It's mostly our flesh, I believe. The devil has a limited army, and unless you're a major threat to him, he probably ain't wasting a whole lot of resources on you. Okay, but our flesh fights and cooperates, right? And and we like to blame the devil for everything. The devil made me do it. The devil did that. I think a water boy, you know, she's girl to the devel, Bobby Boucher. And I'm like, that's good. The devil this, the devil that, the devil this. You know, the Bible actually says that that the, the rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. This desire to destroy each other and to tear everything down. I am, I'm gonna tell you as a pastor, I'm appalled. My job is not to pastor social media. It's not. It's not even to really change their thoughts or their opinions, but it is to pastor the people of Vintage Church. And here's what I'll say. Be very careful how you talk about another believer on social media. 
Be very careful. God is way more loyal to you and to them than you could ever imagine. And, and how we interact with other people is a really big deal, especially inside the family of God. I think we have a whole world that's looking at the church, how we love to shoot our wounded. We love to reshare these postmodern critiques that are absolutely garbage, that have no accountability at the local level, Christianity today being one of them. The truth of the matter is sin exists in every church. I love the people that come up to the guest suite. You know, after service, they're brand new here. They're all happy, you know, in the honeymoon phase, like newlywed. They're coming in. This church is so great. People are so amazing. Everyone loves me. They like everything that I tweet. They reshare me. They give me big digital hugs. And even in person, oh my God, I got a discount at the energy bar. (laughs) But that other church I came from, they're a bunch of snakes, a bunch of devils. I think the pastor's a false prophet. I said, you stick around here long enough. You might just think that many me too. Those same people are still here. We're all a work in progress. Should you treat your spiritual family differently? You absolutely should. And it's biblical. Galatians 3, 6, 10. Therefore, whoever, whenever we have the opportunity, we should be good to everyone. Look what it says. Especially to who? As believers in here, you need to think about that. You really need to think about it. Think about the worst, most embarrassing thing you've ever done, said, or experienced in your life. And then just throw it out on social media. How would you want somebody to respond to you? Anyways. That's why it says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You know why? Because we ain't going to want to do that to us. So we'll be better with each other. The next day, it hinders our prayers. How many of you need to hear from God about something in your life? There's something going on in your life. Maybe it's a big decision. Maybe it's whatever it is you need to hear from God. Matthew 5.23 says this. Jesus says, therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar, you know what that means. Modern, you have your hands raised in praise and worship. It's like your favorite song, you know. Like, way maker, miracle worker. You know what I'm talking about. You know you K-Love listeners. Come on. I listen to Tim, Tim McGraw. But anyways, okay. So, so you, know, you know, you're singing and you're feeling the presence. But then in the back of your mind, you go, man, I, that person has something against me. Or, man, I did something that wasn't kind to that believer. You know what God says? Put your hands down. Stop faking it and go make it right. Then come back and worship me. By the way, he's a good parent. He says the same thing to parents. What do you do when your kids are like, man, I want some ice cream. They come over, I want some ice cream. And you know they just pushed down their little brother or sister. You're like, you're, you're going to go get that right right now. And then when you come back, I just might give you some ice cream. God's the same way. He's very loyal to us. I'm glad he's loyal. He's loyal to you too. You're not giving loyalty to anybody that, 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 that hadn't been given loyalty to you. Does that make sense? It hinders our prayers. It also hinders our spiritual maturity. I've seen this time and time again. Number of years in the church does not equal maturity. I've seen people in the church for years, and they've just sat there. They've gotten resentful. They haven't made things right. They've moved from group to group to group, and eventually they run out of people to be offended about. And what is that? That's spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity can accept that you're a mess, I'm a mess, and we're going to somehow get a little better together this side of heaven. Like there, It's spiritual maturity when you look at someone. By the way, it's actually a mental illness to see somebody as black and white, all good or all bad. The Bible says we're all bad except for the grace of Jesus. What would change in our own life? By the way, every horrible thing that's ever been done in humanity, you realize those people are your relatives, right? You realize you're related to those crazy people. You're also related to the ones who did incredible things. What do you want more of? What do you want to pull out of? It hinders your spiritual maturity. I've watched this. This is why the Bible says that God gives, gives gifts to the church. Not everyone has these gifts. Now, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do work and to build up the church, not to make everybody feel great all the time. I want you to feel great. I want you to be lifted up. But exhortation and encouragement are just one of our jobs as pastors, as leaders in the church. Our main job is to equip you to do work and to build up the church, which is the body of Christ. It says this will continue until we all come to such unity and faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature. Everyone say mature. Mature. The most happy people, the most joyful people I've ever known in the church are mature people. One sideways conversation, one situation that happens, they have so many anchors in the body of Christ, it's never going to blow them out to sea. They're mature In the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. How many of you already measure up to the full and complete standard of Christ? Guess what? You live in a glass house, you better stop throwing rocks. It happens, especially inside the body of Christ. So I did all that. I have 10 minutes left. I'm going to give you a tool. I'm going to give you a tool that I think will really, really help you. 
It's a tool that I use when things go good. I used it. When things don't go good, I didn't use it. And I got to go back to it. Okay. By the way, every time I preach, I'm not just preaching at you. I'm preaching to me. And God's reminding me. I've had somebody after every service. I'm like, okay, I want to make that call. I didn't make that call. Okay. You know what? I got to adjust this in how I'm living. Does that make sense? You want, you need to be able to use what you have. All right, so I'm going to give you the biblical way to resolve conflict. There's seven points. Some of y'all like ordered lists. If you don't like them, you're probably not going to like this church. I love ordered lists. <laughs> I like lines because we can go back to what we actually learned. Inspiration is great, but how many of you know something that really works that you can apply in your life, man, that's worth way more. All right, are you feelers in here? I don't know about that. Well, hang with me. You'll get, you'll get your inspiration from the worship team. They're pretty great. <laughs> All right, the first thing you've got to do, y'all are going to love this, is you've got to act first. In conflict, there's no, you cannot be passive, and you cannot wait for the other person. I remember when I first got married, Kyla was wrong a lot, a lot, okay? <laughs> she ain't here. She was the last service. We don't record this one, but anyways. And I remember, man, we were just getting used to it. Man, I thought marriage makes you happy, you know, 20 years later. Anyways, makes you better, makes you better. I get offended. I wouldn't tell her anything. I'd pout. I think it was her job to come to me about my offense or her offense for that matter. And it wasn't. It was mine. We have to take initiative. We have to take the first step. Matthew 18 tells us how to do that in verse 15. If another believer sins against you, I would say, when? It's going to happen. Go privately and point out the offense, not publicly and share it on Facebook. Don't go ask we use this word process a lot. I just need to process. Process with the Holy Spirit. And then process with somebody who can actually fix the problem. As a pastor, here's what I've learned. By the way, this is the first thing you should always do when you're offended. Always. People that come to me and they tell me their offense, I let them talk. It's fun. And at the end, I say you have three choices. First of all, have you gone to that person? No. Your first choice is you go to them privately and hopefully it's a misunderstanding and you two can work it out. Really? Well, I don't want to do that with my second choice. Second choice, I go with you right now and we handle it. You figure it out. I don't like that one either. I said third choice, I go to them alone and I make sure they know and me and them come to you to fix it. That's pretty aggressive. But what would happen if every one of us lived that way? I demand this on our staff. By the way, that's the most loyal, that's the most loyal thing you can do to someone it is, is give them the dignity and the respect to go to them first. It's very, very important. When that doesn't work, Okay, if you're unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again. Now, this is important. Don't go get a bunch of, you can always find somebody to agree with you. That is not what this is saying. Go find some other people who are not connected to the situation, who know you, and can actually maybe give you some things you should work on too. And once you figure out some of those things, take that person back with you and you guys try to work it out. Come up with a deal. You need to come up with a deal to work on it. What's the one thing we can do to make everything better? Right? That's what the witnesses are all about. Then if they don't refuse to listen, then you bring it to your pastor. I'm like number three. Don't come to me first. 99.9% .9 of everything that happens, most of it is a misunderstanding. We love to make relationships gray, but most of the time, or black and white, but most of the time they're gray. Your sin, their sin, and then just some stuff that happened because of sin. And you've got to work through that. Here's what I've learned. Conflict is never resolved accidentally. Never. Time heals nothing. Conflict is like an infection. This is why the Bible says, go before the sun goes down. Do you know why? You get offended by somebody, you're ticked off. Anybody ever been mad? You live in Texas and you drive on the road. Y'all have been mad before church. <laughs> you're ticked off, you're mad, kids are fighting, something's going on. You're angry with somebody, somebody does something to tick you off. You're mad, you go to bed that way, then you wake up and you're still mad, but you forgot what ticked you off. <laughs> that happens enough. Resentment grows in your heart and you hate everybody. Have you ever met those people? It's like, they're, like they don't age, they prune. That's what that's from. That's what it's from. It's unresolved conflict, I'm telling you. Some of you ladies, you're spending tons of money on anti-wrinkle cream. Work on the conflict first. Sorry. I'll, I'll pick on the guys in a minute. I'll figure it out. I'll come back around. All right, all right, all right. I'm going to get in trouble. The next one, this is great. Own your own part. You've got to own your own part. You have a part. For me personally in our marriage, my part's usually point zero 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 nine, Something around that amount. Start with you. By the way, that's the biblical thing to do. It's called humility. 
They can't argue with something you think you did wrong. Start with you. Matthew 7, Jesus lays out this principle. Why do you notice the little piece of dust in your friend's eye, but you don't notice the big piece of wood in your own eye? First, everyone say first. First, there's an order. Take out the log from your own eye, and then you will have the right perspective to see them clearly. Something happens when you own your own part that softens you, and it changes your eyes. It changes what you see. All of a sudden, you're looking from, okay, I can see their perspective better. And then all of a sudden, you can actually help them. That's called humility. A counselor taught me this years ago, this can save some marriages, some relationships. It will definitely cost, it will definitely save you about 10 grand of counseling. You ready? We don't apologize good. We don't say we're sorry. I'm sorry, man. Sorry, bud. No big deal. Sorry, man. Didn't mean to make you feel that. That wasn't my intention. Who gives a crap about your intention? We judge everyone else by their actions. We judge ourselves by our intentions. Isn't that convenient? Nobody can see our intentions. Okay, here the pastor taught me this. A counselor, Christian counselor said this. You ready? It's good. Will you forgive me? I was only thinking about myself. And then shut up. You say it again. Will you forgive me? I was only thinking about myself. Will you forgive me? I was only thinking about myself. That, that, that's the biblical way to ask for forgiveness. Hey, man, we good? Will you forgive me? I was only thinking about myself. Yeah, pastor, I'll forgive you. And yes, you were only thinking about yourself. All right. All right. Next is you got to learn to listen for the hurt. This is in order. Hurt people hurt people when I get hurt, when you get hurt. We hurt, they hurt, we all hurt, hurt. James 1.19, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. God gave you two ears for a reason. Twice as much. Two ears, one mouth. That's, that's two to one. You should always listen twice as much as you speak. You know why? Does it stand to reason that the person you're talking to might know something that you don't know. That if you knew, it could actually help you, not hurt you. It, is that crazy to think? I don't think it's crazy to think at all. And it also allows you to do this. Consider their perspective. Put yourself in their shoes. How do you do that, real practically? Philippians 2.4, by not looking to your own interest, but to the interest of others. And it goes on to say, by the way, this is exactly what Jesus did. This is how the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords saw through this filter of always seeing other people's interests and need. And the next step is really, really important. You need to learn to speak the truth in love. I, I want to talk about this for just a minute. You still have to speak the truth. It is not love without truth. Do you understand that? It's not love not speaking the truth. That's a world love. That's not an agape love. An agape love says you're blowing it. That's going to hurt you. That's wrong, but I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to help you walk through this. All right? We do not have compassion on people when we teach or live or affirm anything that's not in this book. Nothing could be further from the truth. Did you know you can affirm the truth and still smile? Why? Because you're living it. And you know what? You don't, truth doesn't need a defense. It works. The truth works. Look at our world. Look at the things in your own life that work. The steps you've taken towards Christ that have worked. It, they work. All you have to do is keep taking the steps, right? Don't use truth as a club. You don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. You need to learn to speak the truth in love. Proverbs 12, 18, the words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. In other words, foolish words hurt, wise words heal. Sometimes how you say something really does matter. And I will say this, sometimes because you said something, there's nothing you can do as far as it depends on you. Jesus himself said, woe, not woke, woe, when everyone speaks well of you. To stand for something is to also stand against something else. And the person that stands for everything stands for nothing. Does that make sense? And you're going to stand before God for what he told you to do. My advice says do what he tells you to do and stop complaining about what he told other Christians to do. 
Did you know every fight is not every members of the families? You know, there's members of the family that are a little more disagreeable than other people. And you know what? They're just better up front saying stuff. I'm one of those, by the way. I have no problem with people not liking me. I don't know why. Right? You don't have to, just because I'm different than you, right? You're held responsible for what God's told you to do. That's an issue of personal responsibility and conscience. You should not call out somebody else's. Does that make sense? All right, that's important. Next is focus on the solution. Focus on the solution. You only have so much emotionally, emotional energy. In a conversation, you can either use that energy to fix the blame or to fix the problem. Sometimes that's just the truth. Colossians 3, 8. But now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. You know, in our house, we have certain things that we don't ever say, ever. They're fouls instantly. We call them WMRDs. They're weapons of mass relational destruction. Always and never are on that list. As a married couple, divorce is also on that list. There are lots of things on our list that we just don't say. And then finally, value the relationship. You know, resolution means you got to be the same on every little thing, but reconciliation is about the relationship. There are 10 things that God was very, very clear on in Scripture. I'm teaching about them on Wednesdays if you'd like to come hang out. 10, determine. Those are the only 10 we break on. That's it. We all have our preferences. There are many times different ways that you could go and both are right. One's just better for you and maybe worse for someone else. We got to turn back to what really matters. Again, to paraphrase the Apostle Paul, dearly beloved, in light of God's mercy, in light of his grace for you, live at peace with one another. Let me pray for you. God, I thank you so much for everything you're doing in our church. I thank you, Father, for the season you're taking us in. What an exciting time, a time that you've made us for. You could have had anybody here during this time in history, and yet you chose us. You've also equipped us to win, to succeed, to shine a bright light in a dark world. I pray, Father, that we would continue to do that in our life, and our relationships, starting in our own heart, in our own personal relationships, Lord, that we would take responsibility for growing up and into all that you've called us to personally in our families, in our communities, in our churches, and in our world. I also pray, Father, for those in here that may be far from God. I pray, God, that they would not leave this place unchanged, but, Lord, they would surrender their life to you. And as a result, Father, you would give them back a better life than they could ever imagine living. As heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Let's stay in an attitude of prayer. I believe one of the most important things that we do as a spiritual family is we provide a place and a space for people who are far from God to draw near to him. Maybe you're in here today and you'd say, you know, Pastor, I'm, I'm far from God today. Maybe you used to follow him, but today you're not. If I looked at your life, it'd be clear that you've walked away from the faith. Maybe you're in here and you've never even given Jesus a shot. You've never surrendered your life to him. You've tried everything else, but it's not working. You'll never be all that you were created to be apart from your creator. You can't get to him apart from Jesus. In a moment, I'm gonna pray for those in here who are far from God but don't wanna be. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9 that through an act of free will, acknowledging that Jesus Christ is the Lord, that what the Bible says about him is true, that he died for your sins, that he rose from the dead to give you life. That on the other side of that belief, you can start or restart your relationship with God. And in a moment, I'm going to pray for you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to single you out or bring you to the front. We're not going to do any of that. But I do think it's important if you're in here and you're far from God and you don't want to be, I think it is important that you acknowledge that between me, you, and God. You say, Pastor, pray for me. If that's you, would you just put your hand up halfway and put it right back down? Is there anybody in here that's like that? I see you. His hands go up all over the room. You can put them up and put them down. You're just acknowledging. You know what? That's me. That's where I'm at right now good news is that's not where you have to stay. I see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In a moment, our entire church together is going to pray a prayer. And if you raised your hand and you really meant it, I want to encourage you to pray this prayer just loud enough where you can hear your own voice. I believe that from that exercise of free will, you give permission 
for God to come into your life. I believe on the other side of that prayer, he's going to meet you. We're going to give you some steps, but I believe he's also going to give you some steps to grow in your faith and to stick to it and to grow up and into all that he's created you to be. Church, we believe in what they're doing. Our faith has started in the same place. Let's all pray this prayer out loud together. Jesus, thank you for coming to this earth, for living a perfect life. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for my sin. I believe that you are good, and I believe that you're God. I believe on the third day after you were killed that you rose from the dead. I believe you defeated death to give me life. Today I choose life. I make you my Lord, my Savior, and my King. Lead me and guide me. I trust you completely. Thank you for showing me what's next. It's in your name that we pray. And everybody said, amen. Come on, church. Let's put our hands together.